It is good to be here tonight. We certainly thank God for the Spirit of God that is here. I am glad to be here with you this evening. Let me take a moment to honor and thank the Lord for your pastor, Pastor Fred. Can we give him a big round of applause, please, his leadership? Thank you, Pastor Fred. And you cannot honor Pastor Fred without honoring Pastor Vanessa, who also is standing by his side and equally doing the work of the ministry. So let's give Pastor Vanessa a round of applause also and to my brother uh, Chris House and to the praise team that ministered so wonderfully that this evening and to the band and to those who are working behind the scenes. Let me just say this before I get started. There's not a book that we have ever received that teaches us how to do ministry in a season of a pandemic. And so uh, whatever you see here, I want to encourage you all because sometimes when you go to a place and you're familiar with what you see, you tend to not realize that it's not happening like this everywhere else. And so you all are blessed to have the type of leadership that you have, the type of worship that you have, and I pray that you don't take it for granted. Now, before I get started, on a count of three, I just need y'all to tell me what's your favorite football team, okay, real quick. One, two, three. <laughs> pray, pray for Chris. You know, he already had a right sport. I played, I played basketball in high school and college, and the one thing that I noticed is that uh, in sport, when we watch it on TV, right, and, and our favorite team scores a touchdown, right, and we, we're in the screen, and we're all excited, right, and we're jumping up and down, and we're telling the quarterback what to do and how to throw the ball and do all this kind of stuff. And you know what? The quarterback don't even know who you are. And yet we're talking to them as if they know who we are. We're, we're angry and we're excited and we're doing all of that for people that we see from a distance that don't even know who we are. And the Lord told me a long time ago that how can we give celebration for touchdowns and first downs and all of those things and then we come to the house of God and we're silent. So here's what I need before we get started. On the count of three, if God has been good to you, and he has blessed you, and he has blessed you because you have health and strength. You made it tonight. You've been able to be here. I just want you to say thank you, God, as best as you can with a clap, with words, whatever it is that God leads you to do because we never want to give more celebration to the world than we do to our God, all right? On the count of three. One, two, three. Come on. There you go. There you go. There you go. And that's how we ought to celebrate when we come into the house of God. The scriptures say, I will enter into his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, his truth endures to all generations. All right, I'm ready to get started. Y'all ready for the word tonight? So am I. Uh, would you turn in your Bible, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 30? And uh, we are going to finish up this series, Protagonist Anonymous minor roles, major lessons, and I'm intrigued, and I, and I thank Pastor Fred for this thought. And I want to start at verse number 9, 1 Samuel chapter 30, and I'll be reading it from the New Living Translation. Uh, and so I don't know, Pastor Fred, what's customary? Do you stand? Do you sit? Whatever it is that you do when the reading of the word, we sit down. All right, that's what we're going to do. All right, so if you got it, somebody say, let's go. If you don't have it, somebody say, slow down. Because I want you to have it with you. I want you to have it with you. Now, when you go to the barbershop and you go to the beauty salon or would you get your nails done, it would be a shame if you went in and, and the barber didn't have any clippers or the salon stylists didn't have any tools of which to use. Or the scriptures say that our word of God is the tools that we use to be able to defeat the enemy. And so we want to make sure that we have it with us and available at all times. All right, I'm in verse number nine. Here we go. So David and his 600 men set out, and they came to the brook Besor. But 200 of the men were too exhausted to cross the brook, so David continued to pursue with 400 men. Along the way, they found an Egyptian man in a field, brought him to David, gave him some bread to eat and water to drink. They also gave him part of a fig cake to clusters as a raisins, for he hadn't had anything to eat or drink for three days and three nights. Before long, his strength returned. To whom do you belong and where do you come from, David asked. I am an Egyptian, a slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me three days ago because I was sick. We were on our way back from the raiding of the Carathites in the Negev in the territory of Judah and the land of Caleb, and we had just burned Ziglag. Somebody say Ziglag. 
Will you lead me to this brand, a band of raiders, David asked. The young man replied, if you take an oath in God's name that you will not kill me or give me back to my master, then I will guide you to them. So the Lord led David to them, and they found the Amalekites spread across, out across the fields, eating and drinking and dancing with all joy because of the vast amount of plunder that they had taken from the Philistines in the land of Judah. David and his men rushed in among them, slaughtered them throughout that night and the entire next day until evening. None of the Amalekites escaped except 400 young men who fled on camels. David got back everything. Somebody say everything. The Amalekites had taken, he rescued and he rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, small or great son or daughter, nor anything else that had been taken. David brought everything back. He also recovered all the flocks and herds, and his men drove them ahead of the other livestock. This plunder belongs to David, they said. Here's what I need you to do. Put your hand right here. Put your hand right here, please. I need you to say this with feeling. Don't count me out. Come on, I need you to say it again for somebody that really needs to get that in their spirit. Don't count me out. Count me out. All right, thank you. Let's pray. So, Father, tonight I want to thank you for this moment. I thank you for the opportunity, God, and I thank you for this church that is continuing to do the work of ministry in this uncertain season. And now, God, hide me behind the cross that your people would see all of you and none of me. And now, God, if you would please let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. God, you are my strength and my redeemer. Let all God's people say, amen. Before we get to the reading of the word and what we just read in chapter 30, verses 9 to 20, it is important that we understand the context. You can never go to the verse without understanding the circumstances surrounding what you have read. The story is actually being told not in 1 Samuel 30, but if we can go back just a little bit, we see that this is a long narrative that begins actually in chapter 16 with one of the greatest Old Testament figures that we have, a man named David. We see in chapter 16 that the Lord sent Samuel, the, one of the last and great prophets of that time and judge, to go and to anoint David to be king. It was in 1 Samuel chapter 16 that David was anointed king in front of all of his brothers who had first been selected, but then David was the one that was chosen. He didn't actually become king of Israel until 2 Samuel chapter 5, but it was clear from the very beginning that God had chose David and not man. What we see in the very next chapter 17 is that David in the familiar story that we all know is David and Goliath, where David now kills the Philistine giant. And after he kills the Philistine giant, there's great celebration amongst the Israelites. But King Saul became jealous of David. The people used to shout that David, uh, Saul kills his thousands, but David kills tens of thousands. And now what began to happen was that David, this little shepherd boy who had great potential and was soon to be king, now was on the run by the king of Israel. What is interesting is that David was so perplexed about being chased from Saul that he ends up going into the enemy's camp. Now, you know, it's got to be crazy when the only place that you can find comfort is in the enemy's camp. And here it is now in chapter 29 we see the story of now David is aligning with King Achish. And King Achish was the leader of Gath, which was the Philistine area that belonged to Goliath. And here it is that David now says, I pledge myself to you, and I will serve you. And he was about to go to war with the Philistines against another group of people. As he was about to go to war, the commanders of that army said, no. Nah. They went to Achish and said, sir, you can't allow David and his men to be able to fight with us. We don't know if he's going to turn on us, and he might do that while we're in the midst of battle. Please send David and his men home. Achish said, well, you know what? He hasn't done anything wrong. He's been with us for over a year. Why would we turn him back over? But the commanders didn't trust David because they knew he was the one that killed Goliath. So Achish said, even though, David, you haven't done anything wrong, what I need you to do is go on back home. David said, you know what, sir, I have not done anything to you, so please allow me to stay. But since you asked me to go, we'll take our men home. That ends chapter 29. When we get to chapter 30, what we see in verse 1 is that now it tells us that there is a three-day journey from where they were to the place of where they live, a place called Ziglag. As they are traveling back home, can you imagine as you're walking back to your destination? Can you imagine the scene of what they saw as they were walking back home? Walk with me, please, and imagine about a mile off in the distance, you see smoke on the horizon. 
It's not a clear sky like we see outside today, but you see some haze and some smoke. About a half a mile closer, you see and smell the sense of burning and something is wrong because it did not seem like we're walking into a situation of which we left. You get a little bit closer and your worst fears have been realized that your entire city has been burned to the ground. You left thinking that everything was fine. You left knowing that your family was intact. You come home, you have nothing, and your family is missing. May I pause for just a moment and tell you, it doesn't take much to change the course of a day. Can I tell you that, you know what, you can wake up and have a good day and say, you know what, today's going to be a good day. But how many of you know all it takes is one phone call or one situation or one conversation that can change the course of your entire day and even the course of your future? David now and his men, have returned home, and they don't see their families. They don't see their possessions. The Bible tells us in verse 4 of chapter 30 that they began to weep until they had no more power to weep. Now, you know, men, we don't do that, especially in front of other men. But they were broken down so much that they couldn't take it because they were devastated over the fact that everything that they had was now gone. Now, in verse number 6, something interesting begins to happen. In verse number 6, what we see is that the men begin to turn on David because somebody has to take the blame for what happened in this situation and unfortunately what happens even in the church is that whenever something goes right or wrong it's the leader's fault for what has happened even if they didn't have anything to do with it it usually falls on the leader that's why let me pause for a moment you need to pray for Pastor Fred and Pastor Vanessa because they take the credit and they take the blame of everything that goes on in the house of God they weren't even in the situation when y'all had a meeting, but they got blamed for it because it was wrong, and they are the pastors of the church. Because when things go wrong, leadership gets the blame. So now what begins to happen is David's now confronted with two particular issues. The first issue is that he's got a public scandal that he's got to deal with. The very men that he just went to war with, that he walked with, that he was going to protect their life have now turned on him and are thinking about stoning him because their city had been burned down. And now David is having to deal with a public outcry. But he's also having to deal with a private situation because his family as well has been missing. His wife and children have also been missing. So he's dealing with the public and he's dealing with the private. And now he's struggling to figure out what to do. What do you do when you find crisis in public and crisis in private? Verse number six said that David began to encourage himself. Here it is, in the Lord his God. Lord, this is why I get excited about scripture. I don't know about you all. David didn't get excited just about being excited, but he got excited about the scriptures that he began to remember. And it's in the reciting of the scriptures that David got encouraged along the way. You see, sometimes y'all got to understand that there are going to be situations in your life where nobody's going to be around to be able to help you to really understand what it is that you're going through. And how many times have people said something to you that they meant well, but really it was off? Sometimes you got to know that you have to learn how to encourage yourself when nobody else is around. You got to learn how to talk to yourself. Ladies, you got to learn how to tell yourself you look good in the mirror so that when somebody else comes to you and they say you look good, you tell them, I already know somebody told me that earlier today. You, you got to know how to encourage yourself. Psalm 139 says, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And once you learn how to talk to yourself in the Lord, then whenever is going on in your situation, things can get better. Do I have any witnesses here today that can admit to that? That sometimes you got to speak to yourself. This is going to be a good day because God said so. I'm going to go ahead and make it because I know no matter what comes, I'm going to trust in God. I know that there are going to be times where people is not going, are not going to do right and act right, but you know what, God? I know you're with me because you promised to be with me. Don't always let people steal your joy because they got issues of their own. You better learn how to encourage yourself in the Lord your God. So here's what happens. After David begins to encourage himself, what do you do now after you get, pick yourself up? and get yourself back together. David began to pray. He then says in verses 7 and 8 to Abiathar, who was the priest at that time, Abiathar, bring me the ephod. And the ephod was a garment that they wore that had sacred stones in it. It was started with Aaron back in Exodus 28. And it was there that Aaron used this kind of ephod.
go before the Lord in prayer to seek direction and to seek wisdom and to seek counsel. So here it is that David puts the ephod on and he asks God, God, shall I go and pursue the people that took our stuff and our families? And will we have success? The Lord said, pursue. And I guarantee you, you will have victory. And let me pause for just a moment. The Lord said in verse 8, go. But we still don't know where they are. And we still don't know who did it. But the Lord said to go. You see, sometimes we have to learn how to move when we don't have all the information. And for so many of us, we don't go because we're waiting for God to drop it all in our spirits. And if you're going to wait for God to drop it all in your spirit, you will never leave because God does not always give you the details up front. Come here, Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, he told Abraham, Abram, get up from here and go to your homeland and, and go to another land that I will show you. And if you go. I will bless you and make your name great and make you a blessing and you shall be a blessing. And because Abram got up and went, even though he didn't know where he was going, the Bible says, and the Lord counted for him as being righteous. It is not that you always have to know what God is doing. You have to trust that every step along the way that God will show you what you need when the time is right. So here it is. David decides and to go. Now we're in the text that we read today. And in verse number nine, 600 men decided to go to the valley called Besor. Now, again, they don't know who did it, but we have the best knowing who did it. And it was a group called the Amalekites. The Amalekites were descendants of Esau. And we know that David was descendants of Jacob. In other words, the Amalekites were distant cousins of the Israelites. Now, I know only in my church, y'all don't have this here. That y'all have family issues. <laughs> Cousins you can't get along with. You're good when all the other families show up, but when they come, <laughs> makes you feel a certain way. You at the family reunion. Somebody told me to preach. I feel at home now, yeah. <laughs> You at the family reunion, you at an event, everything fine. They walk in the door. Your pressure go up. Your countenance change. Everything is a little different. The Amalekites were the distant relatives of the Israelites, and they were nomadic people. They didn't have a home. So what they would do is that they would go around and they would wait for opportunities when there was a unsuspecting time where people were vulnerable and they would attack. So they waited until the men went off to war. And as they went off to war, then they went in and they attacked the city, burned it down, and took their families. Doesn't that sound like the enemy? First Peter, the Bible says that Satan is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. If you've ever watched National Geographic, you understand that lions don't wait time nor their energy going after all the herd what they do is that they survey the herd and then they identify the weakest one in the midst first and then they attack that one when the time is right the Amalekites, distant relatives decide to go in we not so here's what's interesting that happened when we get to verse number 10 it says that 600 men started with david to go find their families but when we get to verse number 10, it says 200 of them said, I can't go no further. I throw my hand up. I'm too tired to move forward. Let me drop another point here, just a minor point. You have to come to terms with the fact, family, that sometimes people who start with you are not going to finish with you. You're going to have to come to terms with the fact sometimes that family, sometimes people who say they got you to the end going to leave you at the brook. And you're going to have to decide for yourself, am I going to keep on going? Or am I going to get upset because 200 decided that they can't go any further? 
Sometimes people don't have the same investment you have. They don't have the same uh, future that you have. Sometimes they don't have the same passion that you have. And they're easily ready to say, I'll just go ahead and give up right here. But you got to make up in your mind, I got to press on anyhow to get what God has assigned for me. Now, here's what happens. In the verses 11 13, that's the meat of our particular text. And as they are on their way to try to find their families, we now encounter the protagonist of the story. It is, as the Bible says in verse 11, an Egyptian. That's all we know. There's no name to this Egyptian. We don't know where the Egyptian lived. We don't know their education background. We don't know their family history. We don't know the zip code of where they live. We don't know political ideology. We don't know anything other than the fact that this Egyptian was in the bushes, almost about to die. The Bible says out of nowhere, David's men see this Egyptian, bring, them, bring him to David. Verse 12 tells us that they fed him bread and water. They gave him some cluster of figs and some raisins. And the Bible says that eventually, uh, he restored his health. David asked him in verse number 13, who do you belong to and, and where are you from? The man says, I'm an Egyptian, a slave of the Amalekites, and, and uh, we used to go and raid. We raided the Negev of the Carathites, and we raided the Negev of the Caleb, and we also burned Ziglag. Can you imagine David's ears? When he heard, y'all were the ones that burned my city down. And y'all were the ones that took our families. David said in verse 15, uh, bruh, can, can you um, tell us where your folks are? The man said, I'll tell you on the issues. Number one, you don't kill me. And number two, you don't give me back over to them. David said, bet, just take me to them. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all I need you to do. In verse number 16, it says that this no-name, faceless man led David and his men to the place where the enemy was, was there. The enemy was celebrating having a good time. David and his men went in and raided, the, raided them. The Bible says that they got all their stuff back and even more. Families restored, possessions got back, and they got all the plunder. Now, as I read this story, there are three things that I just quickly want to mention to you that, that stand out to me. The first one is this. The main character of the story is not David. Because David couldn't have found the enemy without this individual. The main character in the story, if the first point can go up, is the first point, are y'all with me? Yeah, you with me, I can't even see, y'all doing good up there. The first point I wanna tell you is that the main character of the story is a no name abandoned it individual who people had given up on and left for dead. The main character of this story is someone who was hurt by somebody who they should have trusted. But in a time of sickness, Lord have mercy, they gave up on him and left him for dead. Now I know all of us like to come to church and give the praise the Lord face and God is always good and God is worthy to be praised every time we come in. But I believe that some people met the Lord just like this man here. You didn't meet him when everything was right. You didn't meet him because your family was all together. You didn't meet him because you had all the money that you wanted. You didn't meet him because everything was going well. You met him in a broken space and you met him in a space where you had been left 
for dead by your own family. You left, you met him in a space where you trusted in somebody that you thought had your best interest and they let you down. You met him in a space where you thought that other people had your best interest and then a time and a tragedy hit and they showed you their true colors. The truth of the matter is none of us come to church all together. And this is why I can identify with this aimless, faceless man. Because all of us, before we come to, to meet the Lord, all of us have some measure of hurt and experience that we have to deal with before we recognize that there is a God that can help me. And here it is, y'all, ladies and gentlemen. Here it is, this nameless, faceless, wounded, abandoned, and left for dead individual. This is what I want y'all to understand. In spite of his circumstances, he still had something to offer to the king. Oh, I wish somebody caught what I just said. You need to understand that in spite of how you may have been treated, in spite of the things of your past, in spite of the circumstances that have gone on in your life, I came to tell you today that you still have something to offer to the king. It might just be a hand wave. It might just be, thank you, Lord. It might just be, God has been good to me. But you have something that you can offer to the king. That's why I'm passionate about how you come in to worship, because you need to understand understand that you have something in you that maybe other people didn't see you have something in you that maybe other people left you and wrote you off but when you have God oh has somebody understand that when you have God you have something that you can offer to the king don't let anybody tell you any differently just because they don't see your value don't let anybody tell you that you don't have something to offer just because you might not have the background like somebody else. Don't let nobody else try to trick you into believing that because if you don't look a certain way, or if you don't speak a certain way, or if you don't have a certain education background that you don't fit the narrative because none of that matters when it comes to God. So you have something to offer, even in coming from broken situations. Second point let me raise is, is this, and, and I want to just touch on this for a little bit. The, the second point that I want you to understand in this text is that you must understand that God does not always send angels in the packaging that we expect. Nobody believes, including me, that the blessing that David needed would have been an abandoned, left for dead Egyptian that was in the field. And I just want to kindly say to you that sometimes we pray to God, God, I need your help. And I need y'all to understand that God does not always answer prayer from the sky. But what God does do is he sends people your way. Now, what if God sent the person, but you couldn't receive the person because you couldn't receive the package that the person came in? So, so now you're mad at God because you're wondering how come God hasn't answered my prayer. And God has said, I did answer your prayer. It's not my fault that you can't receive the package of which the blessing came in. And how many times have we walked past people that don't look like us, that don't act like us, that don't sound like us, because, not because we're different, but because we don't believe that they have something to offer. Here it is. David could not have found his family unless he found first an abandoned Egyptian in the field who didn't look like him, who didn't come from the same background as him, who didn't come from the same hood as him. But that was the blessing that God sent. I just want to ask you, 
How, how many times do we just casually walk past people? How many times do we just keep moving forward? Now, I understand. Don't get me wrong. We live in an age where we got to be careful of strangers and all that. Don't get me wrong. I understand. You have to be careful of panhandlers and all that kind of stuff. And there are some shady people in the world. But let me offer to you Hebrews chapter 13 and 2. Hebrews chapter 13 and 2 tells us, family, that you better be careful how you entertain strangers. Because you might be entertaining an angel and not even know that you're entertaining them. Be careful how you treat people, especially that come in a package that's different than yours. Because just because their package is not yours doesn't mean they don't know God. Doesn't mean they don't love God. Doesn't mean they don't hurt just like you do. Doesn't mean that they don't hear from God. And doesn't mean that they're on assignment to bless you by God. And so many of us have missed our blessing, missed the opportunity for God to do great, because we're more concerned about whether you're white or black. Because we're more concerned about whether you're Republican or Democrat. We're missing blessings because of the package. And when you look beneath the surface, you'll begin to understand that God can send whom he chooses to bless your life. You prayed to him for the blessing. You didn't pray for who he should send. Let God do the sending. You receive the package. Last one and I'm done. The most important part of the story is that you don't have to have a title or a position to make an impact for the kingdom of God. The Bible says in verse 16, in the very first part of the verse, it says, and he led them. Lord, I love that right there. Uh, uh, he led them. Who, who led them? This nameless, faceless, wounded, abandoned Egyptian led the king and led his men to the place of where the king needed to be. And he led him. Uh, no name is mentioned. No title in the church is mentioned. N -n None of that is mentioned in the church. But yet he led them. Let me help y'all understand. They're not the only people that's got anointing in this church. They're not the only people that know how to hear from God in this church. They're not the only people that know how to read a word and get down on their knees and say, Father, I pray to you like them. You have the same anointing. The Bible says that the same spirit that is in Jesus is the same spirit that is in you and I. So then why do we get so caught up in title? Why? Why do you believe that they got more oil than you? They have an assignment and a responsibility to help you to understand what God has put in you. And you can be just as impactful. Matter of fact, do I have any people in here that say, you know what? I ain't even got to be on the stage. I don't have to be seen. I don't have to be out in front. I don't have to have no position. I could be effective just where I am. If I could just help the people on my row, if I can help the people when they walk in, if I could just make a difference wherever I am, I'm good. Everybody can't be a leader. But that doesn't mean you can't be effective. And what we see in the text, I hope y'all understand, is that when others have counted this man out, just like for some of you, others have counted you out, I just stopped by to tell you, you still got something to offer. You still got anointing. You still have purpose. And you still can help them in how church and ministry is done. May I suggest to you, and I've learned this at my church, Pastor Fred, some of the best answers to some of the challenges that we have had in our ministry have not come from me or the pastorship team. Some of the best solutions that we've had in our church came from a member who wrote us in and said, hey, have you considered this? Because maybe this might be an 
answer to your prayer. Family, I got to go. They walking up on the stage. I mean, my time to get out of here. <laughs> but I just want y'all to know, don't let anybody count you out. Don't let anybody tell you you're not worth it. Don't let anybody tell you. You don't have meaning and purpose and value. I don't care what your childhood was like. I don't care what your past was. You're still living because God saw enough in you to allow you to continue to offer something meaningful to advance his kingdom. I got to go, y'all. Love y'all in Jesus' name. Come on, Pastor Fred. Thank you. Come on, could you say thank you to Pastor Kevin one more time? That's good stuff. That's good stuff. Why don't you stand with me? If you're watching from home, just where you are seated, just, just dial in just, just for a minute. You might have kids playing, the TV's loud in the other room, your neighbor's honking the horn. Just kind of dial in with us just for a minute. That, that story, right, it's so rich. That our pain oftentimes positions us for our purpose. That our pain positions us for our purpose. That Egyptian man would have never chosen to be in the circumstance that he was in, but the circumstance that he was in is what positioned him for an eternal purpose. I love that story too because he didn't just help David save his family. God sent an entire army to save that one man. To save that one man. So if you're here tonight and you would say, I'm just, I'm in a place of pain, I just want to ask you to raise your hand right where you are. Just raise it up. Don't, don't be shy. Just hold it up. It could be a physical pain. You're just, you're, it, it could be emotion. You're just in a place of suffering right now that just feels overwhelming. Just put your hand out. I would just want you to keep it up. I just want to pray over you. If you're at home, don't be afraid. Just lift your hand up. Even if you're by yourself, just put it up. It's just your way of reaching up to God. Keep, keep your hand up. Father, I pray for every person that has their hand up right now. I pray for every person that has a hand raised that and they, and they know who they are because as Pastor Kevin was reading that text and telling their story, they immediately identified with that Egyptian man. Something in their soul deep inside said, that's where I am right now. I feel alone. I feel overwhelmed. I feel like there's no hope. And I pray that in this moment, as they raise their hand, that it will be like the Egyptian man that heard off in the distance the thundering of horses at charge. That I pray, Father, that for every person that has their hand up right now, that there would be a hope and a, a faith to believe that you are soon coming to rescue them in their circumstance. And that because we believe, as you wrote, that all things work together for the good who love you and are called according to your purpose, that for whatever this pain is, that it has positioned them for an eternal purpose. And that they're going to come out on the other side of this thing, blessed, whole, restored, redeemed, and satisfied. Come on, in Jesus' name, everybody said together, 